April 6th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Joshua chapter 6 and 7 from the Old Testament. Now Jericho was shut tightly because of the Israelites. No one was allowed to leave or enter. The Lord told Joshua, See, I am about to defeat Jericho for you, along with its king and its warriors. Have all the warriors march around the city one time. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, while the priests blow the horns. When you hear the signal from the ram's horn, have the whole army give a loud battle cry. Then the city wall will collapse and the warriors should charge straight ahead. So Joshua, son of Nun, summoned the priests and instructed them, Pick up the Ark of the Covenant, and seven priests must carry seven ram's horns in front of the Ark of the Lord. And he told the army, Move ahead and march around the city with armed troops going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua gave the army its orders, the seven priests carrying the seven ram's horns before the Lord moved ahead and blew the horns as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed behind. Armed troops marched ahead of the priests, blowing the horns, while the rear guard followed along behind the ark, blowing ram's horns. Now Joshua had instructed the army, Do not give a battle cry or raise your voices. Say nothing until the day I tell you. Give the battle cry. Then give the battle cry. So Joshua made sure they marched the ark of the Lord around the city one time. Then they went back to the camp and spent the night there. Bright and early the next morning, Joshua had the priests pick up the Ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord marched along blowing their horns. Armed troops marched ahead of them while the rear guard followed along behind the Ark of the Lord blowing ram's horns. They marched around the city one time on the second day, then returned to the camp. They did this six days in all. On the seventh day, they were up at the crack of dawn and marched around the city as before, only this time they marched around it seven times. The seventh time around, the priest blew the ram's horn and Joshua told the army, Give the battle cry, for the Lord is handing the city over to you. The city and all that is in it must be set apart for the Lord, except for Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are within her house, because she hid the spies we sent. But be careful when you are setting apart the riches for the Lord. If you take any of it, you will make the Israelite camp subject to annihilation and cause a disaster. All the silver and gold as well as bronze and iron items belong to the Lord. They must go into the Lord's treasury. The ram's horn sounded and when the army heard the signal, they gave a loud battle cry. The wall collapsed, and the warriors charged straight ahead into the city and captured it. They annihilated with the sword everything that breathed in the city, including men and women, young and old, as well as cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua told the two men who had spied on the land, Enter the prostitute's house and bring out the woman and all who belong to her as you promised her. So the young spies went and brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her whole family and took them to a place outside the Israelite camp. But they burned the city and all that was in it, except for the silver, gold, and bronze and iron items they put in the treasury of the Lord's house. Yet Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute, her father's family, and all who belonged to her. She lives in Israel to this very day because she hid the messengers Joshua sent to spy on Jericho. At that time, Joshua made the solemn declaration, the man who attempts to rebuild the city of Jericho will stand condemned before the Lord. He will lose his firstborn son when he lays its foundations and his youngest son when he erects its gates. The Lord was with Joshua and he became famous throughout the land. But the Israelites disobeyed the command about the city's riches. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, stole some of the riches. The Lord was furious with the Israelites. Joshua sent men from Jericho to A, which is located near beth east of Bethel, and instructed them, go up and spy on the land. 
So the men went up and spied on A. They returned and reported to Joshua, Don't send the whole army. About two or three thousand men are adequate to defeat A. Don't tire out the whole army, for A is small. So about three thousand men went up, but they fled from the men of A. The men of A killed about 36 of them and chased them from in front of the city gate all the way to the fishers and defeated them on the steep slope. The people's courage melted away like water. Joshua tore his clothes. He and the leaders of Israel lay face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening and threw dirt on their heads. Joshua prayed, O Master, Lord, why did you bring these people across the Jordan to hand us over to the Amorites so they could destroy us? If only we had been satisfied to live on the other side of Jordan, O oh Lord, what can I say now that Israel has retreated before its enemies? When the Canaanites and all who live in the land hear about this, they will turn against us and destroy the very memory of us from the earth. What will you do to protect your great reputation? The Lord responded to Joshua, Get up! Why are you lying there face down? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenantal commandment. They have taken some of the riches. They have stolen them and deceitfully put them among their own possessions. The Israelites are unable to stand before their enemies. They retreat because they have become subject to annihilation. I will no longer be with you unless you destroy what has contaminated you. Get up. Ritually consecrate the people and tell them this. Ritually consecrate yourselves for tomorrow because the Lord God of Israel says, you are contaminated, O Israel. You will not be able to stand before your enemies until you remove what is contaminating you. In the morning, you must approach in tribal order. The tribe the Lord selects must approach by clans. The clan the Lord selects must approach by families. The family the Lord selects must approach man by man. The one caught with the riches must be burned up along with all who belong to him because he violated the Lord's covenant and did such a disgraceful thing in Israel. Bright and early the next morning, Joshua made Israel approach in tribal order, and the tribe of Judah was selected. He then made the clans of Judah approach, and the clan of the Zerites was selected. He made the clan of the Zerites approach, and Zabdi was selected. He then made Zabdi's family approach man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah was selected. So Joshua said to Achan, My son, honor the Lord God of Israel and give him praise. Tell me what you did. Don't hide anything from me. Achan told Joshua, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel in this way. I saw among the goods we seized a nice robe from Babylon, 200 silver pieces and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I wanted them, so I took them. They are hidden in the ground right in the middle of my tent with the silver underneath. Joshua sent messengers who ran to the tent. The things were hidden right in his tent with the silver underneath. They took it all from the middle of the tent, brought it to Joshua and all the Israelites, and placed it before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel took Achan, son of Zerah, along with the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, ox, donkey, sheep, tent, and all that belonged to him, and brought them up to the valley of disaster. Joshua said, Why have you brought disaster on us? The Lord will bring disaster on you today. All Israel stoned him to death. They also stoned and burned the others. Then they erected over him a large pile of stones. It remains to this very day, and the Lord's anger subsided. So that place is called the Valley of Disaster to this very day. God, you know that this is one of my favorite, all-time favorite Bible stories. Just the power of you bringing them into the promised land, not to share the land with the unrighteous, but to clear out everyone who is worshiping other gods, to make your people, your nation pure, because that's what you wanted for them. And here's Joshua coming in. He has the incredible respect of all of Israel. He's already heard from his messengers, as Rahab told him, that everybody in the town scared to death of them because of God. 
because of you. And can you imagine how the people in the town felt? They're already scared. They're already frightened. They already know that you have sent your people in to annihilate them. And now they're marching around the city. And then they go home. <laughs> and then they march around the city and then they go home. And they do that for a whole week. That would kind of freak me out if somebody was doing that around my house. Um, I just can't even imagine how the people inside must have felt. And I always wonder why they didn't do anything. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know a lot about wartime situations, but it always baffles me if they were already nervous and agitated that you were sending your people in. And here's these people marching around the city doing something that, that to them is a little bit odd. Why didn't they attack? But I'm sure you protected Israel at that time. I love how archaeology, uh, where they believe that Jericho was, uh, that they've found the walls that have fallen um, from the shouts of Israel, from the warriors. Um, and it talks about these great, big, huge 15 foot stone walls. And then on top of it is another six feet of these thick three to four times as high walls and similar walls on top of the embankments. And then they can see that these mud brick walls are crumpled in a heap at the base of the retaining wall. And this crumpling allowed the warriors of Israel to run up into the city, up over the top of the city and attack. It's just, it, it's just an amazing, amazing story. But here's what I find fascinating. I've read this story a million times at least. <laughs> and I got so much out of it from Joshua and even your amazing glory and sovereignty and grace as we watch Rahab be saved and her family, the power of Israel come in and take over their promised land. Just all of these bits and pieces I've even found really amazing business common sense built into these stories. But this is the first time that I connected some additional dots. And I love when you do that for me, God. When Achan took what he did which was not insignificant. It was equal to about how much he would have received over an entire lifetime of wages. When he took that, I always read it as simply punishment. And, you know, I think a lot about that story that if we have sin going on in our churches, they can't be as effective. When we have sin going on in our Bible studies or accountability groups, we can't be as effective. When we have sin going on in our lives, obviously we can't be as effective. And here 30, 30 some, 36 innocent people had to die because Achan was choosing to, to sin uh, against you to do exactly what opposite of what you asked him to do. And, you know, I think about that a lot when things aren't happening in my life the right way and I, I go back and do a check like what sin am I holding on to what sin, sin am I not recognizing what sin um, am I being disobedient in because um, it's usually why you're not answering me but this time I saw things a little bit different and maybe it's just kind of my mindset because I am a single Christian Aiken and his whole family were destroyed Achan, who chose the world, who chose a lifetime of riches, lost his life, but everybody with him went down for that choice. And I think about how insistent you are throughout the Bible about making those right choices of allowing your will to be in our life. And I, I see so many people my age, younger, older, who so desperately want to have somebody in their life that they choose whoever bats their eyes at them first. Maybe they go to church a little bit. Maybe not. And they end up marrying them. And as that person continues to seek the world's riches, that other person either doesn't grow, becomes stagnant, or is taken down with them into the world. And I see this with Achan and his family. Achan chose the world. And everybody who had hitched themselves to that, on down to even his sons and daughters who, by default, by the choices that Achan and his wife made, all of them were destroyed because of that choice of sin, the choice of the world. There's so much in the story, God. So I just absolutely love this story, but I'd never caught that, that 
our choices, if they are not of your will, have effects on us. They have effects on everyone else around us. Uh, they definitely have effect on who we choose to have as our family, our husbands, our wives, our significant others, our children. God, I just pray for all of the single people out there. I know for me, 93% of the time, <laughs> you, you take over my heart and you are everything that I could possibly want. And technically the other 7% of the time you are too, but it does get lonely. Um, and the attentions that I receive from, from men asking me out or men wanting to date me have to be thought through a lot more seriously than the follies of my youth where I just dated whoever to go out and have fun. This is very intentional that if I didn't follow your will for who you have chosen to come into my life and I pick somebody that was of my choosing, of my desires, they could lead me astray to the point of death. They could lead me away from you. Um, they could on Sunday want to stay home, hang out, make me feel guilty for wanting to go. I can't imagine that happening, God, with as much as I love you. But I've seen it happen over and over and over again in so many relationships around me that I suspect it could happen to me as well. I'm already hyper aware of choosing who I'm going to spend the rest of my life with is an incredibly important choice, not only for helping your ministry as we work together, but obviously for the consequences of what those choices are. God, again, I just pray for everyone out there. If they are single, if they're looking, if they're engaged, if they have significant others, that they will remember that first and foremost, you are what fulfills us. No one else can do that for us. Please help me continue to make right choices, God. Please help me to make the choices that are of your will. I know that what you want for me is always better than whatever I could possibly want. Always. I love you very much. In your son's name I pray. Amen.